Yeah, I apologise to anyone who's expecting Mark Lamar. It's become really common. It's, this guy came up to me, the other, I'll get onto the point. This guy came up, to, I'm just gonna press start on this because I have a time limit, which is 20 minutes and given half a chance, I'll just go on for now. So I'm gonna press go, there we go. Somebody came up to me, they said, you're Mark Lamar. I said, no. They said, yes, you are. I went, I'm not. And they went, yes, you are. I went, all right. They said, well, why'd you deny it? <laughs> I was in a hotel in Edinburgh. This bloke came up to me. This is not a stand-up act instantly. This is just... A... <laughs> this guy came up to me and he said, oh, hello, welcome back. I said, thanks. I've never been there before. I said, thank you very much. He said, How lovely to see you again. And I said, oh, that's nice. He said, would you like a, would you like a coffee? I said, yeah, it'd be lovely. And uh, he came, came back with a coffee, and I put my hand in. He said, no, sir, it's on the house. I said, oh, that's really nice. He said, incidentally, my wife was gutted when they cancelled El Dorado. <laughs> that's an age-specific joke. <laughs> so neither Jesse Birdsell nor Mark Lamar. Now, um, on the subject of the, the, the most trusted thing, I should say this at the beginning. This is, this is not an entirely specious fact, although it is one that has no weight. There was a YouGov poll in 2010 that concluded two things, both of which are equally terrifying. The first one was that I am, in inverted commas, the most trusted film critic in the UK, so believe me, I'm gonna live on that. The second one was that less than 4% of the people that they asked trusted me. <laughs> what that tells you is that film critics are not the most trusted uh, profession certainly in terms of what people go to see in, to, in, in the cinema, film critics actually don't make any difference at all. I know there's a, great, um, there's a great body of opinion that thinks that film critics are opinion formers. They're not. The people that actually matter in terms of you making a decision to go and see a movie or not are, and this is no surprise, your peers, your friends. So people who follow each other on Twitter will take Twitter recommendations from people they follow because people that you follow on Twitter are kind of friends. I mean, I know they're not literally friends. I know Danny Dyer doesn't literally have 1.2 million friends, but this is how it works. So film criticism is a really weird thing. It doesn't actually have any weight in terms of marketing. And I don't know very much about film marketing. I do a radio show with Simon Mayo on Radio 5, which some of you may have heard. The only thing which we have ever concluded about film marketing is if you see a film advertised on the side of a bus, it's probably not a good sign. Um, but be, I don't know why that is. It's like on a bus, bad movie. It's like if you, go to, if you go to press screenings, this is a really strange thing. You go to press screenings, sometimes they do catering. And there's a general rule, which is the better the food, the worse the film. I went to a Medusa film, there was like chicken satay and you know, flambe this and flying that. I said, this film must really suck badly. And it did, but the food was great. Um, but what I was gonna talk about was kind of partly related to what's happening uh, at the conference today. As I said, I'm no expert in terms of uh, the, the, the advertising world. Um, and in terms of f film uh, criticism, I don't think film critics are actually experts in what sells or what doesn't. I think the whole purpose of film criticism is just to talk about movies in a way which is kind of interesting and engaging. But uh, there is a general worry at the moment, I believe it's happening in your industry, it's certainly happening around the film industry, that in inverted commas, creativity is not in a wonderful uh, place. A lot of people say, you know, you go to the cinema now and it's all just sequels and it's all just superhero movies. And if you follow the entertainment press, you will have seen recently that Martin Scorsese, in the course of an interview about the sort of current state of cinema, said that he didn't think that Marvel movies were cinema. He said they're not cinema. This is nonsense. They are cinema. They may not be his cinema, but they are cinema. They're moving pictures with sound playing in a cinema that cinema. I mean, you might not like it, but it's a factual truth. The thing is, the idea that everything in the cinema world is sequels and uh, comic strip fair isn't true. It's, it's an illusion. It is true that if you go to your local multiplex or megaplex and you, you might have 10 screens, they might all be showing a different version of the latest sequel or comic book franchise film. Now a film is available in 2D, 3D, 4DX. You know, it is possible for a small number of films to occupy a very, very large number of screens. And when you look at the end of year figures for movies, you realize that there is a small number of movies that do really, really well, and then there's everything else. 
And these are now referred to in Hollywood as tentpole movies. They're the movies that are theoretically holding up the industry. But it's not the case that that's actually what's happening in cinema. More movies are being made than ever before at the moment, partly because technology has kind of democratised the movie-making process, and partly because actually people's interest in cinema has continued to thrive. There's a long discussion at the moment about whether or not people need to see movies in a theatre, in a cinema, for it to be cinema, or whether streaming services are cinema. If you watch something at Amazon or on Netflix, is it a movie? Is something like Roma, which goes on to be a huge prize winner, but had a problem with playing at Cannes because Cannes said it's not a movie, it's a Netflix production. So this is, there's a lot of debate about what actually constitutes a movie. But movies are being made, and more of them are being made, and more diverse movies are being made than ever before. The industry is changing. Um, there was a, a project just recently called Calling the Shots, which was doing number crunching on women in the UK film industry over the past, uh, I think, 10, 15 years. And they were just crunching the numbers on how many women were working in key jobs in film production uh, in the UK. And the jobs were like director, producer, writer. And the statistics were terrible. In terms of cinematographers, it was something like 5% of cinematographers were women, and that was way up on the previous figures. But crucially, it was up. So the industry is changing, and nowadays people, if you see an awards ceremony in which every single nominee is a middle-aged, English-speaking white man, people actually notice. It's not that it's changed yet, but people have noticed it, and it is starting to change. If you look at a year like this year, people talk about, well, there's these Marvel movies, and there's these superhero movies, and there's these sequels, and there's these remakes, and the reason you get sequels and remakes is to do with brand awareness. If you're a studio putting money into a movie, if you put it into something that there's a name that people recognize, your investment is safer. There used to be a rule with sequels. It didn't matter how bad a sequel was, as long as it had the name of the original movie. If the original movie did OK, it would probably take two thirds of the amount of money that the first one took. That's why The Exorcist, which is the greatest movie ever made, that's a fact, incidentally, as opposed to an opinion, <laughs> spawned Exorcist to The Heretic, which is the worst movie ever made. And yet it still made enough money to wash its face, despite the fact that it features Richard Burton flying to Africa on the back of a locust. <laughs> and I'm not making that up. So there's a, there's a reason for making sequels and that sort of stuff, because brand awareness is a saleable thing. But if you actually look at the films that have been playing in UK cinemas beyond the multiplexes, this is the year that Bait became a huge independent hit. Bait is a film made in Cornwall by a filmmaker called Mark Jenkin, who up until now had basically made shorts. He shoots his films on black and white film, on clockwork cameras, without sound, and he produces them all in his studio in Newlyn. He develops the film using a formula that he developed himself, which uses instant coffee so it doesn't produce any sort of toxic side effects. And this is great for making short films. And when Mark said to me that he was going to make this as a feature film, I said, it's a great idea. You are completely crazy. You will never get it done. He made bait, and it's become a really, really big hit. In terms of what it cost and what it made, it is one of the standout hits of the year. And in fact, I would think that when we get to the end of the year, to awards, it's, you know, it'll be something that will win, I hopefully, will win awards at the BAFTAs. We've had uh, Joanna Hogg's film, Souvenir, in cinemas recently. We've had a, a, a really great movie by Shola Amu called The Last Tree in cinemas just recently. All these films are playing in cinemas, but they may not be evident, okay? So firstly, it's not true that what's happened is that creativity has had a bad period in terms of the cinema industry. There is a huge amount of diversity and creativity. It's just that sometimes you don't see it. Barry Norman famously said that in any one year, the percentage of good movies versus bad movies is pretty much the same. It just depends which films you go and see. <laughs> However, there is a perception of a sort of stagnation, which as I said, I don't think has any truth in it. But this is also a kind of weird thing in terms of what film criticism is meant to do. Um, one of the things that film critics are meant to do is to look at films and, in inverted commas, analyze them, you know, make sense of them, talk about them in a way that's interesting and intriguing. And one of the first things that I learned when I was, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm as old as the hills, and I'm so old that I actually remember the Leonard Rosser to Joan Collins adverts, but I can't remember whether it was Cinzano or Martini. I'm sorry, but that's how old I am. 
And when I first started, there was a film discourse, which was that what you did was you talked about films in a kind of intellectual way, in a rational way, in a, in, in a way that was meant to be objective. And there is an idea that there is such a thing as objective film criticism. This is good, this is bad, this is why. It's not true, there is no such thing as objective criticism. All criticism is completely subjective. But what does tend to happen is that critics can fall into this ploy of praising something that has an intellectual, rational, thoughtful response and being slightly down on anything that produces a physical response. And by a physical response, I mean films that make you laugh, films that make you shriek, films that surprise you, films that scare you, films that maybe arouse you. Anything that creates a physical response has generally been considered to be slightly less than a film which makes you go, hmm. Now, ideally, of course, what we do is we'd understand that cinema, as Roger Ebert once described it, is a machine for creating empathy. I think it's a lovely phrase. And we would celebrate cinema for doing all the things that sometimes highbrow criticism criticizes it for. So if you look at words like melodrama, if you look at words like sentimentality, if you look at words like schmaltz, these are generally used by critics in a negative term. Or if somebody says a movie's really funny, it doesn't mean it's great, it means it's really funny. It's not you know, doing anything beyond that, it, but it's really funny. Or, oh, it's really scary. When I say The Exorcist is the greatest movie ever made, people often correct me, and they say, you mean the greatest horror movie ever made? I say, no, I, I mean it's the greatest movie ever made. That is my opinion. I know that it's nobody else's opinion, but it's my opinion, and I'll, you know, I'll stand here for three hours and defend it if given the chance. But there is a sort of suspicion of anything that creates a physical, emotional response. You know, Frank Capra, who's one of the greatest filmmakers of all time, there was this phrase used about Capra movies, which was Capra corn. Capra corn meant that kind of corny, schmaltzy, you know, it's sentimentality that was used to sort of denigrate some of his movies. When people talk about It's a Wonderful Life, which in my opinion is one of the greatest movies ever made, they'll go, yeah, well, you know, it's schmaltzy and it's sentimental and every time a bell rings, an angel gets its wings and yeah, boo-hoo, but it's not, and then they'll name an Ingmar Bergman film or, or, you know, whatever. No, it isn't, but it is absolutely, from my point of view, one of the greatest films ever made. And the reason is because it has an emotional response, because it hits you in a way that is not rational. One of my favorite films of all time is a film called Silent Running, which is directed by a guy called Doug Trumbull. And Doug Trumbull is right at the very forefront at the moment of experimenting with what you can do with cinema in high frame rate, 120 frames per second, 3D experiential cinema, which I have to say doesn't do anything for me at all. But Doug Trumbull made a movie called Silent Running, which is a science fiction movie that's an absolute weepy. It's got music by Joan Baez, it stars Bruce Dern, and it's Bruce Dern and these tiny little robots walking around in space being sad and lonely. <coughs> Doug Trumbull made that film in response to having worked for several years on Stanley Kubrick's 2001. Now, Kubrick's 2001 is generally regarded as one of the greatest films ever made. It isn't. It's brilliant, but it's not as good as Silent Running. And I'll tell you why. Because Silent Running actually makes me cry, and 2001 doesn't. And I like a movie to have an emotional impact. Now, 2001 is an extraordinary piece of art. It's also visionary in terms of its view of science in the future. If you went to the Design Museum's exhibition, the Kubrick exhibition recently, look at how incredibly forward-looking Stanley Kubrick was. I mean, the research that went into that, the work that he did with Arthur C. Clarke, the work that he did with... There's a reason why people think Stanley Kubrick faked the moon landings, because he's the guy that NASA would go to if that's what they wanted to do. Silent Running makes no sense whatsoever. Here's the story. Bruce Dern is out in space with the last of the Earth's forests. There are no forests on Earth anymore. Okay? Point number one, fine, the Earth's dead. No forests, no oxygen, everyone's dead. Doesn't matter. The forests are floating out around Saturn. Why? We just put them in orbit around Earth. Saturn's more picturesque. Bruce Dern is walking around in a spaceship that has gravity. Why? He's in space doesn't make any difference because he didn't want to float around and have the special effects to do that. There are so many, the plants start to die and Bruce Dern, who is the best botanist on earth, doesn't realize that the reason they're dying is that there is no sunshine. 
The thing is, none of this matters when I'm watching the film. And the reason it doesn't is because the film gets to me emotionally every single time. When I first saw it, I was a kid, and I was just in pieces after seeing it. And I have fixated about it for years and years afterwards, or you know, decades afterwards, because it had an emotional effect on me. I know rationally that 2001 is a better film. I know that 2001 was the thing that pushed the boundaries of what the industry could do creatively. I know that in terms of its science and its, in the object uh, sense, artistry, 2001, you know, it's like it's up there with, you know, the Sistine Chapel. I don't care. Silent Running, which makes no sense, is the film that works for me. And the reason it does is because of the emotional connection. Now, I think that there is, um, you're going to have a, a paper a bit later on about the sort of psychology. I'm just making sure that I'm not massively overrunning. No, I'm fine. I'm doing good. I've got like four and a half minutes. Um, about what's happening in terms of creativity and, and, and advertising. And I believe that one of the sort of key thrusts of that is to do with this kind of tension between information and creative effect, something which is uh, intangible to some extent, something which is that, you know, that thing that I'm talking about with Silent Running and It's a Wonderful Life and Casablanca and Mary Poppins and Singing in the Rain and every other film which is, for me, great cinema. Cinema will only work at its fullest potential when it engages the emotions along with the intellect. You look at a film like Bait, on a technical level, it's extraordinary. Somebody in the 21st century has made a proper feature film using clockwork cameras, 16 millimeter film, home developed, sound dubbed on afterwards. It's the kind of thing that you would have been doing back in the 1930s. That's not why the film is a success. The film is a success because it has a story that is grabbing people emotionally, particularly people who either live in or are familiar with Cornwall and familiar with what's happening to Cornish fishing villages, incomers coming in and changing the, the nature of a, 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 of a place. And incidentally, it's not a film which is one-sided. It actually does see both sides. But it works because it's firing people up emotionally. Now, from a film critic's point of view, I wrote a long piece about it in The Observer in which I spent most of the time talking about its brilliant technical achievement and why it is that it's artistically important and why it is that it's... But the, it, none of that would matter if I hadn't watched the film and laughed at the jokes, been made to feel tense by the, the kind of, you know, the, 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 the plot as it unfolds in this strange and mysterious way. And I hadn't actually felt powerfully emotionally engaged with the characters. Because in the end, that whole thing about information, you know, rational discourse, and that irrational other thing, they're not separate. They're part of the same thing. But if you only have one of them, you don't get the best possible response. I know loads of films that intellectually satisfy me, but don't make me laugh, don't make me cry, don't make me scared. One of the reasons I think The Exorcist is the greatest film ever made is that I think there are really good reasons for saying that it's a really profound theological tract. I think there are really good reasons for saying that it pushed the boundaries of what was possible in cinema in 1972, 1973. I think it has the most avant-garde and inventive soundtrack of any film I've ever seen, but none of that matters because it scared the living daylights out of me when I first saw it, and that's the thing that welded it into my consciousness. And I love horror movies. I, as I was mentioned before, I did do my PhD on horror fiction. It's a real thing. Uh, you know, I, there we go. You know, I am a doctor of horror. You know, <laughs> ask my wife. Uh, but for me, that is kind of one of the reasons I love horror cinema is it has that kind of primal engagement. So to draw things to a close, and I think brilliantly to draw things to a close with 90 seconds to go, I'm nothing if not a good timekeeper. That's what years of working with Radio 1 will do. If you, cra if you crash Sting's vocals, they fire you. Um, it's to say that I think the, one of the subjects that you're talking about in terms of creativity um, and in terms of information versus whatever that other thing is, this is something which is happening across a whole number of different areas. And the honest truth of it is, firstly, it's not as in crisis as it looks, at least in cinema it isn't. In fact, in cinema, 
I think cinema is in extraordinarily good shape. Every year when I do my you know, list of top and, top and bottom 10 films of the year, it's quite hard to find the bottom 10, but the top 10, it's like you know, there's 40, 50 titles will be contenders. The other thing is that in the end, you know, telling a story or selling a story, it doesn't make any difference if that story doesn't hit you somewhere emotionally. Because if it doesn't, you're just telling it or selling it to yourself. Thank you.